Aloha. Welcome to this week's edition of Live from Noir Lab from Hawaii. My name is Jamika and I am an outreach assistant at the International Gemini Observatory, which is a program of NSF's Noir Lab. So today, joining me as moderator is my NORLAB colleague, Robert Sparks. We really appreciate Rob joining us today as moderator. Um, as my normal moderator, my colleague Leinani Lossi will actually be one of today's guests. Before we move on to our guests, let's talk a little bit about Gemini Observatory. The International Gemini Observatory is actually one of five programs of NSF's NORA Lab, which is the preeminent U.S. National Center for Ground-Based Nighttime Optical and Infrared Astronomy. Gemini Observatory is composed of twin telescopes, Gemini North, located on Mauna Kea, at an altitude of about 13,382 feet, um, just a little bit over 4,000 meters, and also Gemini South, which is located on North Central Chile's Cerro Pachon. Now, Gemini telescopes observe invisible and infrared light. Its eight meter reflectors collect this light with mirrors that are coated with a special layer of protected silver rather than aluminum, which is the more traditional coating for large telescopes. Now, the mirror is made of ultra low expansion glass and is about 20 centimeters thick. Gemini also has these very large vents, uh, which are opened uh, during the nighttime uh, for observations, which allow that cold night air to flow through the observatory, which produces more stable images. And with telescopes in both hemispheres, Gemini can observe objects throughout the night sky. And now for our Gemini news update. And there's there's so much going on this month. Um, it's uh, Citizen Science Month, International uh, Dark Sky Month, uh, just so much going on. We have Black Hole Week coming up. Uh, so I thought this is a perfect time to talk about, of course, black holes. And our newest press release just came out. Black hole pairs found in distant merging galaxies. So astronomers have found two close pairs of quasars in the distant universe. Follow-up observations with the Gemini North spectroscopically resolved one of those distant um, quasar pairs after their discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope and the Gaia spacecraft. Now, these quasars are closer together than any pair of quasars found so far, providing strong evidence for the existence of supermassive black hole pairs, as well as crucial insight into the galaxy mergers in the early universe. Now, I will definitely have a link to this press release, as well as a link to our CosmoView uh, Cosmo video series. Uh, we have a very new one that goes with this press release. Look for that in the video description. On to today's guest. So um, today we'll be talking about the 2021 Waimea Solar System Walk. And we have three fantastic, amazing guests who um, really made this year's Solar System Walk 
extra, extra special. And I will let them tell you about their amazing contribution. First, let me introduce you to our three guests, beginning with Leinani Losi. And those of you who have watched this show before know that Leinani Losi is uh, my colleague, Norlab colleague here at Gemini in Hilo. Originally from Waimanalo, Oahu, Alyssa Leinani Losi is a UH Hilo alumnus and has worked in the communication, education, and engagement department of Gemini Observatory for five years. Welcome Leinani as a guest. Next, we have Alexis, Alexis and Akohito. Alexis was born and raised also on Oahu and is a UH Manoa alumnus where she graduated with a BS in mathematics. She interned at the Institute for Astronomy on Maui through the Akamai Workforce Initiative, as well as Gemini Observatory as an outreach assistant. She then worked at Gemini Observatory as a media, as a media relations and local outreach assistant. She currently works at the East Asian Observatory um, and James Clerk Maxwell Telescope as a telescope systems specialist. Welcome, Alexis. And our final guest to round out this amazing trio is Shelly Pelfrey. Shelly serves as the outreach coordinator for the WM Keck Observatory and provides administrative support to multiple departments at Keck. She also manages the observatories. Shelly, I'm gonna mess this up. Pronounce that for me again. Kalihiao. Kalihiao program, which offers Keck employees resources for learning about Hawaii's culture, history, and place. An avid cook and crafter, Shelly often shares her skills with the Keck family, including creative outreach programs like moon face cookies and lay making tutorials. Thank you so much for joining us today, Shelly. And uh, thank you all three of you ladies for being with us. I will go ahead and stop my share so that we can begin with our first presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, am I good there? You guys can see my screen? Yes. Okay. Fabulous. Uh, thank you so much, Jamika and Rob. Thank you so much for hosting this today and moderating uh, this live from Noir Lab. It's a real pleasure to be here and share our story today. Um, today, of course, we're here about the Waimea Solar System Walk. Um, and we're here in a very interesting year, right? We've, we've got COVID going on. So um, in the past, of course, this was always done in person. Um, if you're not familiar with the Solar System Walk, because we do have this international audience here, uh, this was an event that was held on the campuses of Keck Observatory and Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope. And both of our headquarters are located in Waimea on the Big Island. This is kind of in a windward area where we get a lot of rain. So it's very green. It's a beautiful um, venue and the public comes out and gets to have a stroll. So it's a healthy way to get out and learn about our solar system. Uh, we started this event in 2009 and we held it every other year as it was in its infancy. So 2009, 2011, 2013. And then in 2014, we decided, you know what, we need to make this an annual event. This is getting so popular and it's really great for the kids and the families. And we made it an annual event. Um, we partner with uh, Mauna Kea observatories with all of the rest of the telescopes. And um, sometimes we have folks that come out from uh, partner agencies. So usually at this booth for the sun, we get Mauna Loa Observatory, which is a solar observatory. They're not on Mauna Kea, but they still partner with us. So it's really nice to be able to um, have those relationships. Uh, as you can see here, we've set up tents on lawn and on the lawns and people would just stroll along and learn something in every booth. And it was a great hands-on community event. And then COVID happened. 
and we had to decide what we were going to do about continuing the event. Sorry, my phone, I can't make that stop. There we go. Uh, we had to just decide what we were going to do about continuing the event. And we did decide that we, we wanted to make sure that we provided this service to our community. And so instead we chose this venue here, which is um, on the left side of the screen. This is the bypass road in Waimea. And you can see there's a really nice wide sidewalk and the community uses it already for walking and running and getting their dogs outside and socializing. And we decided this would be a great place to have our, our new virtual event. Uh, what we had to do was um, make sure that people could social distance. And so, you know, it's outside. The planets are really far away from each other, just like they are in our solar system. And so it was good that um, everything was outside and across an entire mile. And so um, there was a lot of distance in between these stations. Instead of tents, we had stickers on the ground and we've actually graduated from stickers to the banners that are staked into the grass and to garage sale signs that are also staked into the grass just to ensure that um, our message doesn't get lost. Uh, you can see there's a QR code on the, on the banner that's here on the ground and that's scannable to get you to a video. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the information that we were providing to the public was as much as possible like the information that we were providing at our in-person events. And so we tapped our uh, partners at the Mauna Kea observatories and other institutions to help us out with that. And that worked out really well. Um, since Easter was this past weekend, we did an Easter egg hunt and that was super fun. Uh, we got it out there on our social media and hid some hid some eggs along the route and kids were able to get out there and um, collect swag from the different Mauna Kea observatories and add that to their, their Easter baskets. Uh, part of the videos that we created for the solar system walk um, were of course brand new to all of us. We had never done these videos before. This was a completely new territory for us. And we decided that videos was going to be videos were going to be the way that we were reaching our new virtual audience. Um, and as the walk concludes here, more and more of these videos will be available on our Mauna Kea Outreach Astronomy YouTube site, along with our Facebook. And so even if you aren't in Waimea to scan that QR code, you can still access these really great educational videos. And there'll be a link at the end with those in them. Um, like I mentioned before, each of the stops along the solar system walk has a poster, um, a banner like you see in these pictures here, and each of those QR codes has a different video. Uh, when we were making these videos, of course, we started out all in English because we all speak English here in Hawaii. And we, we decided that we really wanted to make sure that we included Hawaiian language. Um, because we do live here in Hawaii and uh, the discoveries that we feature in each of our stops along the solar system were discoveries that were made on Mauna Kea. And so to make sure that we included Olelo Hawaii in these videos was super important to us. And I know Lenani and Alexis are going to be talking about translations and how we made the videos. And so I'm going to leave that part to them. Um, but I did want to say a uh, huge mahalo, huge thank you to our partner institutions and those that have helped us with the English, just the English part of the videos. Um, and you can see here, I've listed everybody out. I would do a call out to all of them, but then I'd end up talking about them for the next half an hour and we don't have that kind of time. But um, these, are, these are all people that have other jobs other than outreach, except for Jamaica and Mary Beth and Carolyn. But you know, they're giving their, their really, really extremely valuable time um, because they believe in education and they believe that community relations are so important. And so um, please go ahead and check out um, these videos when, I, when you get to the link at the end. Um, I also want to say that because of this new format with COVID, um, we had to develop new ways of marketing this event. It wasn't, wow, what's that white tent over there? Let's go check it out. We had to get on social media and really push our message out there. And so um, uh, Alyssa, Ali Clark from East Asian Observatory helped us out with graphics. Um, this is that nice uh, opening logo that we have here. 
And she also helped us design our road stickers and our road banners that included the QR code. We also worked with a new graphics designer, um, Tomi Takimura, who did all of our video editing for us. And they're so amazing. I, I really hope that you take some time out to check our videos out. So I wanted to say um, mahalo to them as well. And of course, can't do it without my two partners in crime. Um, this is the organizing committee here, Mary Beth from Canada, France, Hawaii Telescope and Carolyn, who also served as our Mercury video. That's why she's doing this because she's pointing at Mercury. Uh, and so these two ladies uh, really helped to move this process along, make sure we got all of our permits in place, made sure we have everything ordered and that this came off without a hitch. And so mahalo nui to them as well. Um, we have our materials on the website. And so what you can do is you can actually download these things and create your own solar system walk. And so we've done all the hard work for you. All you need to do is find a place to put it out there. And so you can see our website down there at the bottom, it's bit.ly slash Waimea Solar System Walk. And with that, I am gonna turn it over. That's, that's great. I think I will chime in here for a moment as we in our transition periods. So that's always a great time to break in. We have a couple of people in the chat starting there. Freya Hunt says mahalo. Uh, just a nice little mahalo from her. We have a question from Alan Jackson. Um, uh, he says, did you use a specific application to generate your QR codes? And another listener, uh, another viewer in Blachex, I'm probably mispronounced that, says it was a free website, but I was curious if you could tell us which free website you used. Oh, the Bitly. So the Bitly is the website shortener. So all of our information, um, web information is being hosted by Canada France Hawaii Telescope. It's, so it's on their website. So when you hit that Bitly link, it'll redirect you to Canada France Hawaii Telescope. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as far as QR code generator, um, our graphic artist did that for us, but I know it was a free program. And I've, I've created QR codes. QR codes on um, on the web before, and there's a ton of free programs out there. Okay, so so there's a lot of free programs. I, I've not used a lot of them myself personally, so I don't have recommendations, but to thank you very much. So I will let you go on to the next speaker now. That was great, thank you. I actually have a question for you, Shelley, before we move on. Um, if a school or an organization wanted to, um, or wanted some help creating their own solar system walk, could they contact you? They could. We can uh, put my email down in the bottom of the video. I think, Jamika, if that's possible, that would be great. Mahalo, Shelly. All right, so I think it's my turn. It's all right. Okay, so let me share my screen. Um, aloha mai kako, everybody. Um, thank you, NORLAB, for hosting this. Thank you, Shelley, for your talk. Um, so uh, the kind of bit that I contributed to uh, the Solar System Walk was uh, researching the Hawaiian names for the planets to include in um, our Olelo Hawaii videos. And so like Shelley touched on, uh, outreach in the era of COVID, you know, really forced us to re-examine uh, the way that we did outreach and just by nature of the social distancing, it really skewed heavily to video formats. And um, as Jamaica mentioned in my intro, uh, before I was a telescope operator, I uh, specialized in outreach. And so it's something really important to me. And especially, you know, if we're making these videos that are going to kind of be immortalized, Im yeah, immortalized, um, you know, what, what was the information? what kind of information do I want to put out there? And so um, I started doing these short videos, um, uh, introducing uh, Hawaiian astronomical terms. Um, and they kind of got picked up uh, and we host them on our MKO at Home website uh, and YouTube channel. And um, I just want to highlight that Hawaiian is very much a living language. And so these are some you know, some of these terms we never really had historically. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're getting these new words all the time. And so it was just a way for, for me to get more in touch with um, Olelo Hawaii, but also uh, to kind of share that with a, with a wider audience. Okay, 
So as far as historical Hawaiian names, the only planets that had historical Hawaiian names were Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Um, and there are several names for each and the names used kind of depended on, you know, who was looking at it, where they were and like what kind, uh, what time of the day or what time of the year uh, it was being observed. And so for example, Venus, these are some, these aren't even all of the names for Venus, right? So we have Hoku Loa, which is um, kind of the more, I guess I would say more popular, more most used uh, name for Venus, but there's also Hoku Ali'i, Hoku Ali'i Vahine, Kohoku Komohana, Hoku Ao, Hoku Ahiahi, and Kaavela, which is actually a name it shares with Jupiter. So, you know, if you were uh, a farmer and you were waking up in the morning and you saw Venus, you know, close to the sun, they would call it Hoku Ao, which is morning star. Um, if you were uh, you know, out fishing and the sun was setting and you start to see Venus um, in the sky, that, that would be Hoku Ahiahi, uh, evening star, and that was kind of like the marker of, okay, it's time to, to go to shore now because, you know, sun's setting pretty fast. Um, and then there are some new Hawaiian names for planets, and so if anyone wants to chime into the, the chat, um, I just I put a question here. Why, why do these planets and Pluto, our dwarf planet, uh, why do they have newer names? Why are there no historical records for these names? Um, let me answer my own question. Um, so Uranus is Heleakela. It's a Hawaiianized version of the name Herschel after William Herschel who discovered Uranus. Um, Neptune has a kind of Hawaiianized version of the name Nepekune, um, and then Pluto is Ilioki. And so um, the reason that these are new Hawaiian names, that they don't really have, you know, any historical context for these planets is because they weren't visible with the naked eye. And so uh, Hawaiians are very, very good naked eye astronomers, um, but you can't name something you can't see. <laughs> So that was that. Um, as far as resources, uh, Hawaiian is a very like oral based language and tradition. Um, and I kind of had to cross reference several sources, especially because there were so many different Hawaiian names for some of these uh, uh, planets that were closer to Earth. And so um, the, one of the primary sources I used was vehevehe.org. It's this incredible online Hawaiian English dictionary and database. Um, also used the Polynesian Voyaging Society website, um, hokulea.com. Um, some other sources that I use is a Hawaiian Almanac and Annual for 1887, uh, Hawaiian Astronomical Concepts, which is a, a really nice article, and also Nainoa Hoku which is uh, the names of the stars. And that's a, that's a really great book. I encourage everyone to check it out. And that was the research that I did. So I will hand it off to Leinani. Mahalo, Alexis. Um, before we move on, maybe if anyone has any questions for Alexis and her process, um, I guess I have a question for you. What was the, the most challenging part? Did you find it challenging at all researching some of these things? Ooh, I guess, um, you know, not only did I want to know what the names were, but kind of like how they came to be. And like, for some of them, you can kind of tell, you know, based on the names and the descriptions, but, um, you know, not always. And so kind of had to do a little bit of digging there, but it was, it was really interesting and really fun to kind of to kind of get that new information. Hey, I I don't we don't have any questions in the chat right now, but I do have a question. I you caught my curiosity on a point here, and you said that there was like different names for some of the planets. Like Mercury might have different names, and I was curious mm -hmm. about that. Is that because they were did they evolve on different islands or different groups within Hawaii, or how how those different names come about? Totally. Idea? So yeah, I mean it was just it was a bunch of different things. So um, that is one of the ways is, you know, 
we were a seafaring people, but they, we had these kind of like isolated groups, uh, these isolated populations on each island. And so, yeah, they would have maybe a different name uh, for Venus on Kauai than they would on Oahu or on Maui. So, um, yeah, that is one of the reasons. And it's a new, a new uh, uh, I, like to, I see a question just came in the chat from uh, Heather Bartlett. There's a wonderful question. She says, Alexis Mahalo for your presentation. How are the new Hawaiian names created? Like who agrees on them? And that is also a wonderful question. Ooh, that is good. Um, you know, I would say kind of, mm, I guess it depends, right? So we do have like the College of Hawaiian Language um, at UH Hilo and UH Manoa. And so um, they are the authorities, right? And so when they come together, um, they kind of decide, you know, these these new names that are kind of being introduced into the lexicon. And so Ohua Heinoa is a great program um, run out of the University of Hawaii in Hilo. And uh, these are uh, the College of Hawaiian Language students and professors, and they get together and uh, the Mauna Kea Observatories work with them. And we, um, you know, they figure out uh, new names for these these new objects that we're finding all the time. Yeah, that's a great question, and I would add that um, you know there's there's more native speakers outside of the university, and sometimes they don't always agree with what the university decides is the the new standard. Um, so I know one example is uh, the word for cute in Hawaiian. I think is Kyuke. Kyuke, yeah. <laughs> and I know some people who really don't like that. <laughs> well, thank you. That was a great answer. I love hearing about that. And we have one more comment. Thanks, Alexis. I love to hear about the different names of Venus from Jasmine Silva. And with that, I will uh, let you let us go on to the next speaker. So please thank keep your comments and questions in the chat. All right. Aloha Nui Kako. Hello, everyone. My name is Alyssa Leinani Lozi. You can call me Leinani, and I am your next speaker. Um, you might also recognize me. I help to host these live from Norlab events, but today I'm doing a presentation, so I hope that you enjoy it. Uh, a couple quick things before I share my screen. Uh, Alexis, when you were talking about your presentation and about Ilioki being the word for Pluto, I realized that we use the wrong word in our solar system walk videos. I totally rewrote what you wrote as Ilioki in our script to Ilikoi. And I was the person who read that script. So I distinctly <laughs> remember saying Ilikoi for every single part. <laughs> um, that's one way to get a different dialect, people. <laughs> hey, we're, but, uh, we're getting it out there. We're getting it out there. <laughs> So we'll have to go back and maybe record that and create new decals and everything. Uh, but hilarious, you know, we are, um, none of us here are really experts at Hawaiian language, despite the fact that we are all native Hawaiian women born and raised in Hawaii. Um, and I will talk a little bit about how can that be <laughs> in my slides? Um, but before I move on, I also just wanna mention my amazing background here is uh, the black hole M87, the first ever imaged black hole, also known as Povehi. And I've chosen this image, one, because it matches my dress, just kidding. Um, I've chosen it because, it, you know, the creation of its name from the program Ahuahei Noa is such an amazing feat. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that but also this Saturday, April 10th, is Povehi Day in the state of Hawaii. When this image came out, our governor, uh, Governor Ige, declared that April 10th, the release day of the image, is now Povehi Day, a state recognized day. So it's kind of just a beautiful thing that shows um, how much we can and do love astronomy here in Hawaii. All right, and from there, I will now share my screen and talk to you about how I created the Alelo Hawaii scripts. Okay. So again, talking to you about the, the scripts for the solar system walk videos that uh, I translated into Alelo Hawaii with the help of Alexis 
and her amazing research that she did finding these traditional names, which I then ignored, right, Alexis? Ilikoi, I can't believe that. Anyway, just kidding. I really tried to stay true to everything and include all the variations of names that Alexis found for us. Um, I'm an outreach assistant at the International Gemini Observatory here, here in Hilo, Hawaii, uh, which is also now a part of NSF's NOR Lab. All right, so if you have not seen any of the solar system walk videos yet, uh, here is one. Hopefully, you'll be able to hear it. Welcome to the planet Mars. My name is Chris Yocum. I'm from the Pacific International Space Center for Exploration Systems, also known as Pisces. If you were to visit Mars, you would definitely need a spacesuit. It's a cold, rocky planet with a thin atmosphere made up of mostly carbon dioxide, which humans cannot breathe. Mars is one of the most explored places in our solar system. Being the fourth planet from the sun, it's a close neighbor to Earth. It also has a lot of similarities to our home planet, like seasons, ice caps, volcanoes, canyons, and its own weather systems. But Mars has stark differences too. One Martian year is equivalent to 1.88 Earth years for 687 days. And it's roughly half the size of our own planet. It has two moons, plus the force of gravity is very different. If you weighed 100 pounds on Earth, you would weigh about 38 pounds on Mars. Fun fact, Mars gets its reddish color from the blanket of oxidized iron dust that covers its surface. Basically, it's rusty dust, which is why the Mars is also referred to as the red planet. Enjoy the rest of your trip through the solar system. Up next, the asteroid belt. Now we have the Olelo Hawaii video. Uh, this one is done by Shelley. Eya o hoku ula. Ula ula o hoku ula i kapo haku meki. O hoku ula, hoku ula pina au, a me au kele nui aiku na inoa ea e o hoku ula. He hoku hele kino paa o hoku ula. E lua mahina o hoku ula. Mahalo ya oe i kaho alahe ana mai. A hui ho e hoku ula, i kipa kako i ke ka e hoku nai. All right, so you might notice a, a couple of things uh, from that video. Number one, the Hawaiian video is not a direct translation of the English video. Um, and that is because I am only a second year student and that's like 100 level classes because I had to start at the 101 level and I'm in two years of classes now and I'm still not at 200 level. Uh, because that's how little Hawaiian I knew before starting classes. And so coming from a very beginner standpoint, I um, did not think that I would be able to translate the English scripts or the English videos that my colleagues at the other Mauna Kea observatories had so wonderfully created. Uh, so instead, I tried to come up with a template of concepts that I wanted each video um, in Hawaiian to, to include. And so we'll get to see uh, what all those different concepts were, but from there I used what sentence structures that I knew about that I had learned in classes to create um, these scripts. And so in this presentation that I'm about to do for you, we're gonna talk about, well, why? Why do we do videos in Olelo Hawaii in Hawaiian language? And then we'll talk about um, the, some of the sentence patterns that, that I used for creating the videos. And then we'll kind of just talk about some of the, the beautiful aspects of the Hawaiian language in general. All right. Okay, so why Olelo Hawaii? Um, I really wanted to create this slide for a lot of our viewers are not from Hawaii and maybe are very unfamiliar with uh, the things that Hawaii has gone through, um, but also to sort of acknowledge that, you know, NSF's NORLAB, we translate everything into Spanish because we work with our Chilean colleagues um, and, you know, astronomy should be for everyone. And maybe one day all astronomy things could be translated into all languages. But why did we, you know, why are we so stoked that these videos exist in Olelo Hawaii? Why are there press releases about it? Um, why is it so uncommon? 
and this is a little bit of the reason why here. So this is a little brief history lesson, okay? In 1840, the first ever public, not the first ever, a public education system was established by King Kamehameha III in Hawaii in the Kingdom of Hawaii. And this actually makes it one of the oldest public education systems in the United States, which is pretty cool. Fast forward like 53 years, the Hawaiian kingdom is illegally overthrown. Three years after that, Hawaiian language is banned from all schools in Hawaii. Two years after that, 1898, the United States of America annexes Hawaii as a territory. And then, you know, almost a hundred years later, we are actually granted statehood. So there's a very long gap there between uh, us being a territory and then becoming a state. In the 1970s, uh, we experienced a Hawaiian language revitalization movement. And so some of the pictures here I have on this slide, the very old picture is King Kamehameha III. And then the newer picture is Larry Kimura, who is often thought to be the grandfather of Hawaiian language. So in 1970, he created a, a public radio show in which he interviewed uh, native Hawaiian speakers. And those recordings are still used today in a lot of Hawaiian language classes to learn sort of um, the syntax and the vocabulary of what a native speaker with uninterrupted generations of speaking at home sounds like. So we very much uh, can attribute, contribute. <laughs> we thank Larry Kimura very much for all of the amazing things that he has done and continues to do, uh, which we'll talk about on the next slide. So that was in the 1970s. In the 1980s, through this movement, uh, some of the first Hawaiian language immersion schools are created, including Aha Punana Leo, which is a preschool Hawaiian immersion program. And so where are we now, kind of 2016, uh, there was a government report on languages spoken at home in Hawaii. And our state's population is 1.4 million people. And of that, they found that there were about 18,000 Hawaiian speakers. So that means only 1.2% of our state speaks Hawaiian at home. And um, for that matter, you know, not everyone in our state is native Hawaiian. And so to sort of touch on that, the people who identify as native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander in the Census Bureau that we do here uh, is 26.7%. So you can kind of see that of the state, you know, 26% is native Hawaiian, but only 1% is speaking Hawaiian at home. And a lot of that has to do with, um, as I said before, you know, once the language was banned from schools, uh, it was essentially erased from common use within the community at, as a whole. And so there are generations um, within our own families who did not learn to speak Hawaiian. And so this is the struggle that we're kind of up against when we talk about uh, how great the resources that we have now in Olelo Hawaii are, because we've had to recreate some of these resources and, and um, not update, but like create new words for the things that we have today, right? Like a word for airplane is mokulele, which means a uh, island jumping. <laughs> so it's kind of just a, it's a fun thing to do. And I think that all three of our speakers here, all three of us, I uh, would say that we feel very blessed to be able to work in astronomy and work with Hawaiian language and sort of deciding uh, what direction the language and culture and astronomy are going to move in. Okay, other reasons for why Olelo Hawaii. So besides, you know, the history of it and wanting to contribute to there being more resources for our future generations to be able to speak Hawaiian fluently about all fields of research and all topics, uh, we're also just, you know, we're in Hawaii. <laughs> so why not have everything that we do in Hawaiian? But also from a perspective of uh, psychology and multidisciplinary learning, when we can learn something in more fields than just one, so when we are learning something and looking at it from a perspective of learning about science, but also practicing our language skills, we're creating associations within our brain, within our psyche, that allow us to learn that material a bit deeper and maybe even better. And then in addition to that, 
uh, different languages, you know, languages from everywhere in the world, all provide a different lens with which we can see the world and understand what's around us, right? So it's not just language for language's sake, but it brings this depth, this otherness to the material, to the objects that we learn about um, that can help us to relate to those things in a different way, that can help us to understand them better instead of just in one sort of one sort of lens. Just as we look at space in many different wavelengths, we can look at all fields of research from multiple perspectives, whether they're cultural, different languages, or even you know more artistic perspectives. So those are some reasons for why I wanted to create these videos, even though it was very difficult for me as a beginning student um, and took me a very long time. Mahalo to the Solar System Walk organizing committee who waited for me to create these scripts. All right, and then of course, um, Ahua Hei Noa, as we, Alexis mentioned before, is a program uh, run by the Imi Lo Astronomy Center in which new names are created for newly discovered astronomical objects uh, from the Mount Kea Observatory. So here are a couple different examples. We of course have Povehi on the left and behind me, um, which as I said before, first ever image black hole. And I think the second uh, object to be named by Ahua Heinoa. I think the very first object was Oumuamua, though technically that was uh, maybe just Larry who, who named it and he like spearheaded it and you know started this movement of okay we got one object named in this and accepted by the International Astronomical Union so let's keep this going like this is possible and so then Povehi came and you know obviously everyone was really excited about that we have Povehi Day and since then we've had a couple other uh, objects named through this initiative, through the Uhuheinoa program. And I think all of them so far have been named by different cohorts. So Povehi was named by a different cohort than Ponio Ana. And this picture here of this group um, is the um, Hawaiian Immersion School students that Alexis mentioned, who helped to name two different asteroids, uh, whose names I should have put on this line because I'm not going to remember how to say them right now. <laughs> but they went through a whole learning process workshop of, um, I want to say a few days where they went to the observatories, they learned different concepts about space and physics, and then learned about these newly discovered objects that weren't uh, announced yet so that they could come up with names through a very traditional Hawaiian naming method and then uh, submit those to be accepted by the International Astronomical Union, which I believe they were. So if you click on the link, the hyperlinked uh, link here, or if you even just Google search Ahua Heinoa and you go to Amy Loa's website, you can learn more about all of these things. And this one last picture here is Ponioa Ena, um, which is a massive quasar in the very early universe. So mahalo to Ahua Heinoa for being such an amazing inspiration, an amazing uh, bridge between the Hawaiian language uh, students and teachers that exist here and our Mauna Kea observatories, um, while a lot of us are still honing our skills so that we can help with this initiative and make it even more commonplace. Thanks, Alyssa. I have a quick question from the chat here. Um, first of all, the, uh, the, we do have a nice comment from uh, Alan Jackson, he just says very nicely stated, so he's enjoying it. And from uh, Stat Grazer Girl 30s, mahalo for a very interesting presentation. And she wants to know, are Hawaiian language classes offered in public schools? And what's the status there? And I think it's really neat that this is going on there. Ooh, that's a good question. So um, I'm going to age myself a little bit here. But I graduated from Castle High School in 2012. And uh, when I went to school, the languages that were offered to us, because as Americans, we all know that we are required to take another language in high school. Do we learn that fluently? Most times not. But anyway, the only languages that were offered at my high school were Japanese uh, and Spanish, I believe. So, you know, within the public school system, I, I don't know that there's really that many 
programs or, um, you know, even enough teachers to be able to teach Hawaiian in every public school. But as I said before, there are some immersion schools uh, like Punana Leo and, you know, uh, private schools like Kamehameha schools are able to teach Hawaiian there. Um, I also went to an elementary school called Puahala, which was both immersion and English speaking. So it was very interesting. So I remember being very small and we had a kumu who would come and teach us songs in Hawaiian, which was really beautiful. Okay, and I, we have another comment here. Part of it's in Hawaiian, so I'm going to, I hope I don't mutilate it too bad, <laughs> but I recognize a couple of the words. Mahalo nui loa, Lenani. It was wonderful to learn more about the collaboration between uh, Oleo Hawaii speakers in the, in the astronomy community for this project. All of you were amazing. And she also says, my high school, Waike Waikia had a Hawaiian language program. So there are, apparently are some in, in Hawaii. I think this is great to get the objects named in Hawaiian and with Mauna Kea Observatories, there's an endless supply of new objects to name. So that's a great resource and a great collaboration. So that I'll let you continue. All right, mahalo nui for that comment, yes. Okay. All right, I only have 15 minutes left and I, I said I was gonna talk about a lot more than I have. So we're gonna file through this and maybe you'll learn some uh, basic Hawaiian things from the rest of my slides here. Okay, so there's two types of translation that you learn about in Hawaiian 101, and that is unuhi laula and unuhi haiki. And so you can kind of think of them as one is directly translating, unuhi haiki is direct translation, like word from word drop down, but it's also sometimes thought to be a more Hawaiian way of thinking. And it's similar to olelo pa'iai, which is pigeon. So here I have a, a cover, a picture of a cover of a book, Pigeon to the Max, which is, uh, which was created, you can research about this, but it was created as sometimes called a broken English for Hawaiians and uh, many other um, nationalities of people who moved to Hawaii in the 1840s as part of the sugarcane um, boom, as the sugarcane uh, industry that existed here and was the economic resource for everything for like a hundred years. Anyway, so an example of this is pehea oi is how are you? Uh, but if you directly translated it down, you would be saying how you. And if you talk to anyone who speaks pidgin, uh, they might ask you this in this way. They'd be like, hey, how are you? Like, like how are you doing, you know? And so that's unuhi haiki. Unuhi lao la, you kind of have to massage the words that are there to get out the, the English, right? So what we would view as for someone who's maybe from the mainland, who's like, how are you? What does that mean? Like, how do I do something? It's like, no, it means, how are you? Uh, so there are certain words that don't really exist in the Hawaiian language because of the way uh, that the grammar is done. So, if you're familiar with pidgin, then Hawaiian is a little bit easier to learn. If you're not, it might be a lot harder to learn. And so we'll see some of that in the uh, types of sentences that we go over. Okay, here's the my template for each script that I created that I mentioned earlier. And so these are the things that I really wanted every video to include. They don't all include this <laughs> because uh, first of all, some objects uh, don't have moons, right? Here we have number of moons is one of the things. Mercury does not have any moons, so it doesn't have a line about that. Uh, but also when wanting to translate translate an interesting trait or characteristic, uh, my, my grammar skills and my vocabulary got the best of me a little bit and I couldn't uh, exactly communicate everything that I wanted to. But we got, we did do a lot. We got a lot of things in there and it because it's at such a basic uh, 101 level, I think that actually makes it more accessible to a lot of people who are maybe just learning Hawaiian. So please go watch all the videos. <laughs> but here's a couple of the different sentence types that, are, that I used in creating these scripts. Okay, so here's one sentence cut type. It's called Pepeke Painu. And Pepeke Painu uh, essentially uses like verbs or uh, descriptive words at the beginning of the sentence, and then that's followed by the subject. So if you wanted to say that lady runs, then you would say runs 
first and then that lady. Yeah, or if you wanted to say um, that flower is pretty, you would say pretty first and then that flower. And so that is a pepeke painu. And when you would read it in Hawaiian, you would see that you have that descriptive word or a verb first and then followed by the subject. So that's kind of how you recognize that it's a pepeke painu. Meka, meka a ano just means with an a ano. So we have verb sentence with a ano. A ano is a type of word and it is um, a descriptive word or it uh, is like a trait or a characteristic. So you would describe the word pretty as an a ano. Uh, so my, my name, Leinani, actually means lay pretty. So the pretty lay, because <laughs> nani means pretty. So here are some examples from the actual scripts. Uh, vela, vela loa kala in unuhi haiki, so direct translation straight down to the English words, this would mean hot very the sun. <laughs> or you could just be like, oh, hot the sun, you know? But if you massage it into unuhi laula, into more English grammar, this would translate, of course, to the sun is very hot. Then we have ula ula o hoku ula, which directly means red Mars. But in lao la, what we mean it to mean is Mars is red. So something you might notice here in the direct translations compared to the uh, English translation is that the word is does not exist in the Hawaiian language. And so there's no way to say is something you have to use the correct sentence type to be able to get that across. So in a very similar way, I actually am I'm just realizing I didn't do this on purpose, but a, a similar um, goal of this next sentence structure of pepeke aikehe and pepeke aikeo is that in these types of sentences, we are saying one thing is equal to another. And so this is where it can kind of get confusing, right? Because you could say like, oh, aren't you trying to say the sun is equal to being hot? It's like, no, we're saying hot is the sun, right? That's the characteristics we use pepeke painu. But here we're using pepeke aikehe and pepeke aikeo because we're saying that something is equal to something else. So in our example, um, he hoku hele kino paa o ukali ali'i. Directly translated, this means a planet solid Mercury. But in Lao La, what we mean it to mean is Mercury is a terrestrial planet. So again, there's no is, right? But hey, so hey that we have at the beginning of the sentence there uh, is the word for a. Uh. So anytime you're saying that something is a uh, something, you are using pepeke aike he. And so you would start the sentence with he. So if I wanted to say my mom is a teacher, I would say he at the beginning of the sentence. But, <laughs> and this is where uh, it gets fun. I don't want to use the word confused, I guess it's fun, right? Uh, pepeke aike o is a similar goal of saying one thing is equal to another, but we are not using a. Uh, so with the example I used before, my mom is a teacher, I would use hey at the beginning. If I say my mom is the teacher, then I'm using pepeke aike o. So in our example here, we have o pele kainoa o kekahi lua pele, which means one of the volcanoes is named Pele. This is in reference to the moon of Io, um, which you can learn a little bit about in the Jupiter video if you go and watch that. And so you'll see that, you know, there is no a uh in that sentence, right? So we have to use pepeke aike o and start with that okina o to indicate that we are now stating that something is equal to something else. All right. So those are, those are the only two types of sentences I'm going to go over because that's probably already a lot to digest if you're not familiar with Hawaiian language at all. Um, but those were, that's a couple of the uh, things that you learn in Hawaiian 101, some of the very basic sentence structures. So if you enjoyed that, I encourage you to take a class online. UH Hilo does online classes. That's where I learn from uh, and learn a bit more about Olelo Hawaii. Okay, so now to talk a little bit 
about kind of the beauty of, of the Hawaiian language. And, and so in this, um, I'm talking about the dual meanings that exist for different words. So it's really quite interesting to me in studying Hawaiian language, I have found that the Hawaiian language is both very direct and very poetic. <laughs> and so in the direct sense, a name of something encompasses its characteristics. So when we look at um, a phrase of words I used before, hoku hele kinopa'a, uh, this directly translated, if you just separate those two words, it, it's planet and solid, right? Kinopa'a is the word for solid, something that's not gaseous or liquid, it's solid. But when we say it together, we're using it to mean terrestrial planet. And so what we're really getting from it from this word is the characteristic of what it is, right? Because if you're familiar with astronomy, the terrestrial planets, the four first planets closest to the sun are all rocky planets. So they're all solid opposed to the gas giants that are uh, further away in our solar system. And then we get to um, some more, you know, actual names of things. So Hoku'ula, the name for Mars, one of the names for Mars, um, if you take apart those words, it means star, hoku is star, and ula is like a short word for red, because you could say ula ula is more common to say, but you could also just say ula. And so Mars uh, appears in the sky as looking like a red star, right? So its name, hoku ula, is representative of what it looks like, of the characteristic that it encompasses in the sky. And then lastly, hokuhele, which is the word for planet. If you take those words together, look at the base words, again, you have star, hoku, and then hele means to like move around, to, to go somewhere, yeah, <laughs> to go. And so it's a star that moves, right? Hokuhele were bright objects, they look like stars, but they're moving much faster in the sky than the stars are, right? So that's how they got their name of hokuhele. Okay, so that to me is the more uh, direct, direct, uh, directness of the Hawaiian language, which I find to be very beautiful. Um, the way that it can be very poetic takes a lot more study uh, of like different cultural components and of the history. And so here's a couple of things that I just read about last night, uh, but there's all sorts of examples that you learn in a 101 class. And so, um, ka'ove nahinahe akavai directly means the soft murmur of the water. But it, if someone is using that to sort of describe something that's like happening around them or whatever, they're actually talking about like gossiping, like someone is gossiping. So it's like very poetic. Like it's like a more pretty way to say that gossip is happening. Instead, you're going to say like the soft murmur of the water is, is happening over there, right? And then our next example, Ka opua ha'a heo ika leva. Uh, the cloud billows stand proudly in the air. If you were saying that maybe about someone or near someone, it's almost like a like a coded way of saying like, oh, that someone over there is conceited. <laughs> like, like maybe they're they're all high up in the clouds, you know, they think they're so above everyone else. Um, and so it's it's kind of a fun thing that. Even in uh, single words, um, like the word lehua, which is another word for a type of flower, is sometimes used for the word blood because it's a prettier way to describe uh, to describe blood. It's like by the color of the lehua. Okay, and that brings me to the end of my <laughs> very quick uh, runaround of how fun and interesting it really was to create these scripts and all the things that I learned. I hope that you got to learn from this presentation as well and that you enjoyed it. I wanna say mahalo nui to Shelly Pelfrey, who's here with us today and to Matthew Brown, who also works at Keck Observatory with Shelly uh, because the three of us together actually read the Olelo Hawaii scripts that I created uh, in, the, in the solar system walk videos. And I'll say it again, you know, I'm still a beginning student. It'll be a few more years before uh, I'm really fluent, maybe a lot more years. 
Um, and so I really, as you've probably heard, stumble over my words sometimes in pronouncing things, but I really loved hearing Shelly uh, read out the scripts that I created uh, because her pronunciation of things was just so, so beautiful. Okay, and here's some sources, which I will add to later, but I'll stop sharing my screen now. And I think we're almost out of time. <laughs> yes, we are. That was fantastic, Lenani. Thank you very much. Just a couple of quick comments. And I think we'll have one one last question. I think it's interesting enough. We should go over a minute or two if that's okay, just to have it addressed. But Stat Statter Girl Grazer Girl 30 says, as a bilingual speaker, I really appreciate learning a bit more about the syntax. Mahalo Nui Lenani for the explanation. Janice Harvey says, outstanding, meaningful presentation. Thank you very much, presenters. And finally, our uh, M. M. Blachak, who I'm again, I might be responsing that, but says uh, has one question. Our last question, I think, for the group: What part of this process have you enjoyed the most? So that I guess that'd be for Shelley, Alexis, and Lenani. What have you enjoyed the most? I think um, for me, um, the best part was like taking our event that we've been doing for the last however many years, and like reimagining it, and just like putting all of our creative juices together and getting this new thing going. So working together with all of you guys. Yeah, I would say um, for me, I guess just like getting to, to relate, you know, astronomy, which is something that I love to, you know, my cultural identities, like that's always really, really fun and um, something that I, I take a lot of pride in. All right, and my uh, favorite part for me, there's a couple. Uh, one, I super agree with Alexis about being able to really use these two parts of our identity um, syn in synchronous, I can't, I can't speak English right now, but uh, <laughs> to use them together in such a beautiful way, um, I really hope to continue practicing that and creating more resources and learning more about astronomy, but also of course about Olelo Hawaii so that I can create more resources for all of our students and for the MKOs. Um, but really the best part about the whole process was the end, <laughs> seeing it done and having it well received um, was just such an amazing feeling. And really, I, I can't thank uh, Shelly enough for what I think she did such a great job pronouncing everything um, and bringing such emphasis to what were just like words on a page where, you know, like, of course they have meaning, but the way that she emphasizes the different words uh, within those sentences is just, uh, to me, was, was so Hawaiian, was so spot on to what it should be. So please go watch all of the videos see how amazing everyone does in English and Hawaiian. And mahalo nui for being here. Thank you, everyone. And I will turn it back to Jamik at this point for a wrap up. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, everyone in the YouTube audience, we very much appreciate you supporting our program, um, adding comments and all of these amazing questions. Um, to our presenters today, three amazing ladies that I am very pleased to call colleagues and grateful to be able to work with and to be inspired by. Um, so thank you for joining us very much. And of course, for all of your work um, that you put into having the Solar System Walk be able to now be offered not only in English, but in the Hawaiian language. And I have to say, uh, as a person who's had um, a couple of classes, Hawaiian language classes at UAT Lo, um, it was really nice to be able to follow along just a little bit in um, Leinani's explanation of the syntax and to be able to uh, understand at least a few words of what I'm hearing uh, in, the, in the actual videos. And I have to say, again, for for just for me, uh, it creates a fantastic connection to the community that I am really glad we now have um, as part of the Solar System Walk. And I hope, uh, Shelly, maybe you could speak to this, that in the future going forward, uh, we're able to maintain this and, and keep this Olelo Hawaii part of the, of the Solar System Walk going forward. Uh, that, is, that is a huge hope that we can have in the future. Um, 
as we all learn more, as we um, gain mastery in the Hawaiian language, it would be fabulous if we could have a Hawaiian language speaker at each of our booths in the future, at our like in-person solar system walk booths that could give voice to the Hawaiian language and how important it is in astronomy today. Absolutely, Shelly. Well, we look forward to that in the future. In the meantime, um, for today's show, I want to say a big mahalo nui loa to everyone for joining us, especially our presenters. Thank you so much. And of course, next week here on at this time, we on the same Nora Lab channel, we will have uh, our in vivo program in Spanish. So we hope you can join us. <laughs>